almost everyone used to assume that if you did any kind of work around prisons, you were working for prison reform. If one looks at the history of the prisons in this country, one sees that from the very beginning, it was about reform. The prison itself was supposed to be a reform, right? And then um, reforms have actually helped over time to create a stronger institution of imprisonment. Some years ago, I, I, I would say that uh, for me personally, I began to consider myself a prison abolitionist in the early 70s. I'm going to keep on struggling to free the Solidarity Brothers and all political prisoners because I think that what has happened to me is only a very tiny, minute example of what is happening to them. There was a strong movement for prison abolition that was expressed, for example, in the Attica. Uh, rebellion. We are men. We are not beasts and we do not intend to be beaten or driven as such. The entire prison population, that means each and every one of us here, has set forth to change forever the ruthless brutalization and disregard for the lives of the prisoners here and throughout the United States. If one looks at the media of that era, newspaper articles, you'll see that actually very prominent figures are taking seriously the idea that we need an alternative to uh, imprisonment because it wasn't working. The problem is this, this idea that prisons don't work has been with us almost as long as prisons have been with us. And so there have been those who say that prisons don't work and then they say, well, what do, we, what do we need? Let's reform the prison so it works. So let's create a better prison, a bigger and better prison. And then that prison doesn't work. So what do we do? We reform it by making the institution stronger. And so what happens is that you're, you're caught in this circle that where the solution to the problem always becomes the problem itself and it reproduces the problem. So the prison is, is a problem. The solution to the problem becomes the prison, and so forth and so on. So this is why it's necessary to break that, that cycle and to talk about alternatives that are completely outside of the universe of the prison. So we have to think differently. There are lots of ways to do that. One is to look outside of the United States and see how the vast, 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 vast majority of the world's population deal with all kinds of problems and solutions to them. Uh, the way that poor countries and countries with diverse populations uh, manage to figure out how to understand um, and uh, cope with differences, including behavioral differences between people without locking people in cages and so forth. Well, obviously, to get to abolition, we have to re- shape how we do things, right, in terms of practices, policies, everything. So strictly speaking, that would be reform. But the question is, can we figure out a way to engage in non-reformist reform, which is to say reform that doesn't make the prison system bigger, just as we seek to engage in reform that doesn't make the education system um, uh, expel or miseducate ever more children, right? Uh, just as, as uh, we try to think about how we can reform things so that they become new rather than more of the same. They don't care even about a million man, million woman, million youth march. You can get 10 million people out there one day. One day. They don't care about that. They can deal with that. But it's the ongoing work that's a threat to this system. It's people every day working for their freedom, making it clear that our freedom is important to us and that we ain't going to sit back and watch these prisons build faster than we can blink an eye and be filled just as fast. We ain't going to have it. That's the message we got to send. Initially, Critical resistance uh, was a movement um, uh, coming out of a conference 
that was created by uh, a group of about 25 um, scholar activists, activists, former prisoners, people who were still in prison, um, artists, um, lawyers. Uh, uh, we simply got together in the Bay Area and decided that we wanted to bring together people who were doing work around prison issues. We wanted to refocus people's attention on something we then began to call, using Mike Davis's term, the prison industrial complex. That was because we noticed then, this was in 1997, that people tended to assume that whoever was in prison was in prison because they had committed a crime. And it may be true that people who are in prison have committed crimes, but that may not be the reason why they're there, because many other people commit crimes and don't go to prison. So we wanted to popularize an analysis that would allow people to use terms, new vocabularies, terms like the prison industrial complex. And I must say that we thought that, uh, that our conference would be successful if we, uh, if we attracted three or 400 people. That was our initial goal. But as it turned out, something like 3,500 people showed up. It was quite incredible because this was a conference that was organized uh, in the old way. You know, we had hardly any um, funding. We had no paid staff at all. Everyone uh, volunteered. You're going to mug me? I might get a mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veely now. It has been a long time coming. And of course, many of you who are here this weekend have been working with the most incredible determination over years and over decades. I don't know, but this may very well be the first time that so many of us have gathered together to figure out how to organize a national, sustained anti-prison campaign. And Critical Resistance is a national movement to abolish what we call the prison industrial complex. So in other words, to end the use of policing and prisons and surveillance to solve what are essentially social, economic, and political problems. Um, so we're working to sort of simultaneously dismantle the use of incarceration uh, in U.S. society and build uh, the kind of society that would not need to rely on prisons and policing. And so what critical resistance has become is an explicitly abolitionist organization. And, and the way in which it understands abolition has so much more to do with the rest of the society in the world than just the prison industrial complex itself. What, what critical resistance understands at the core of its analysis is that the prison industrial complex is in a sense a crystallization of the forms of white supremacist and class and gender violence that we see in the world at large, and particularly in the United States at large. The problem with prison as a reform is what you're really asking for is a reform of violence. We have the lights on 24-7 and the electric fence behind me is going all the time. What you're asking for is a reforming of a racist slave relation. And, and the fact is, to reform that is really just to change the institutional arrangement in which the violence happens. It does not directly address the relation of violence itself. On the one hand, if we're talking about an institution that at its core is about a systemic way uh, to practice racist violence on large numbers of people and class violence on large numbers of people and gender and national violence on large numbers of people, if that is at the core of the prison system and we understand that and, and, we, and we dispute the premise that this is really about criminality and criminal law, then what we, what we can understand politically is that the reform impulse is actually wrong-headed from the start. How many beds can we build and how fast can we build them? 
we've now progressed in our thinking to say not only how many beds can we build, but can we build the right kind of beds for uh, the needs of our population. What's so significant about this is there's about $6 billion worth of additional AB 900 funded projects that will be started and under construction within the next next five years. The team members that um, Chris talked about earlier, Nocton and Lewis, the construction team, they're going to partner together with our Green Building Services consultant to identify opportunities to be more energy efficient, more environmentally friendly. To reform is to suggest that there is a good way to have this system exist, right? That there's a humane way to have a profoundly racist, classist, uh, and misogynist, and sexist institution exist. What abolitionist politics attempts to address is the relations of violence themselves. In, in the very short term, we have to deal with the fact that people are dying because they're not getting adequate health care. That's fine. But our objective is not to make the prison a more functional health care institution. Our objective is actually to eliminate the relation of violence that is at the core of this entire uh, carceral prison system to begin with. If we shift uh, the register a bit and talk about what it means to be an abolitionist, uh, how one has to rethink not only modes of justice uh, that happen at institutional levels, but how we personally um, think about uh, our relations with one another. In, in, in this country and in, in, in the West in general, we have um, come to think about um, um, revenge as the only possible response when one is the target of wrongdoing or uh, when, when, when something bad is done to us, our first response is to think about how to get back at the person who did it. So how do we change that, uh, that, 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 that idea? Um, I was sober about, um, about four years, four years and some months, and I was doing good. You know, I was going to program and staying sober. And um, I had given birth to my um, my one son, Richard. And, um, you know, just in the midst of my serenity and my, what I would call, you know, halfway normal life, something I didn't know before, um, I had gotten a phone call at like 3 in the morning. And I was asleep and my uh, stepdaughter answered the phone. And basically it was um, some detectives calling from Riverside um, wanting to inform me of a tragedy that took place in my family. And uh, so, yeah, that phone call told me that my mom and my 13-year-old son had been um, tragically murdered. The guy that committed the murders was going out with my daughter. It was like a powerless moment, you know, um, completely powerless, completely just without, you know, um, ability to do anything about it, you know. I, I, you know, got involved in the lead workshop got involved in critical resistance and, you know, they just really helped me a lot, you know, to see that, you know, um, this guy can be real rehabilitated, you know, that, you know, as much as I don't want to think that, you know, I, I know today that it's a possibility, you know, um, that, uh, you know, his life is being wasted just sitting in prison, you know, completely. That's not the answer. You know, and I know it's not the answer, you know, him sitting in jail. Um, you know, his story can be used to help other people, you know. Um, you hear all the time on the news about boyfriends killing their girlfriends and, you know, husbands killing their girlfriends, girls killing their, you know. So obviously there's a problem, you know. So I don't think sitting him in jail is, is, the, is the answer. You know, he had a moment in his life where he snapped. He snapped. You know, I mean, there's moments in my life, you know, with my kids back where I snap. You know, I don't do anything stupid like that, but, you know, who's to say that's not possible for any one of us, you know? And uh, we all have the ability to, you know, find help. You know, we all have that right to find help, you know? So you might say that, uh, you know, what people in critical resistance call um, abolitionist values requires us to rethink our own uh, emotional responses. Uh, so alternatives would involve um, different modes of justice, reparative justice, restorative justice, uh, justice that does not rely on retribution and um, revenge. Uh, 
Uh, there are existing organizations. There's in Oakland, for example, Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth. Uh, my sister happens to be the executive director of that organization. They go into schools. Uh, they go into middle schools and high schools, and they work with, with kids. Uh, uh, and they teach them how to resolve conflict by talking to each other and, and by healing whatever um, uh, um, issues and conflicts emerge by sitting around in a circle and talking about them. And almost every school they've worked in, within a short period of time, there are no more fights. You know, people learn different ways of, of dealing with what is perceived as wrongdoing. Why can't that happen on a larger level? You know, why, why does the court system have to assume that uh, somebody is always right, somebody is always wrong, and somebody has to pay for it? You know, the whole notions, that, the concepts that we use, a debt to society, are, uh, are really all about retribution. Well, I don't um, know that anything totally works because they're talking about ending global oppression. So I think we're all experimenting with things to see what happens. So I think it's kind of revolution through trial and error. And I think part of, I think part of having a critique of the prison industrial complex uh, necessitates a critique of a nation state form of governance, but also necessitates a critique of kind of these naturalized hierarchies as I've discussed, which I think are very gender based. And then when you do that, your movement has to be a little more humble because it's less like you have the revolutionary vanguard elite who knows what to do and more realization. If anybody really knew what to do, they probably would have ended global oppression by now. So let's just admit we don't know what we're doing and let's just try stuff out. So that, in, in that spirit, I could say what people are trying, but I don't think we can say this is the solution. You know? I personally feel that sexual violence and heteropatriarchy are the tools to naturalize other social hierarchies. So that's why I think when we look at the conquest of native peoples, the enslavement of African American women, et cetera, these strategies are always accompanied by sexual violence in order to naturalize these social hierarchies in our community so that we will accept social domination. So I think that's the issue with reforms. But obviously we can't go from here to prison abolition in one swoop, right? So we're going to have to try things. And the things we try may not work, or it may seem like it was going to work at the time, but it turns out it doesn't, or it may work at one point and not another point. So I just think we, we have to keep um, a commitment to the vision and not the strategies. I'm not anti-reform, per se, but I think that any reform strategy has to be done with a larger vision for where we want to go. Because so much of what we have to do right now is a politics of survival, in essence, right? And a politics of urgent reform, which is different than reformism. We have to sometimes engage in urgent reform because we want to make it to the next step of, of li sometimes literally of life, right? Sometimes we have to engage in a politics of survival and urgent reform because some people will simply be gone, um, both in the sense of being locked up for a long time or, or, or dead if we're, not, if we're not taking those practices seriously. So this makes the on-the-ground rendition of, of, of abolitionist politics very difficult and very complex and challenging. Part of the abolitionist politics is that it's, it's, to, it's to defeat the sense of isolation and, individualized, and, and, and individualism that is oftentimes inculcated by the criminal justice system, which treats people as individuals, right, or, or under this mythology that they're being treated as individuals. What, what abolition on the ground in part looks like is to break down those walls of isolation and, and, and individual compartmentalization and to say this is happening to a bunch of us, right? My story is not that different than yours. You know, um, what happened to me is, was very similar to what was happening to the guy in the next neighborhood or the guy in the cell right next to me in the jail. Uh, so what I've seen in organizations that take that, that kind of politics seriously is a much more collective systemic analysis that links people's individual histories to a systemic violence. Um, and what that leads to then is a bunch of different political conclusions. Then what people are saying is no longer, well, how can we just get people good lawyers? Right? They're, they're not stopping at that. What they're saying is that, yeah, well, we need good lawyers to try to keep us from going to, to jail and prison. But what we also have here is, 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 is an institution, a system, which is actually targeting us. Right? And what we need to do is challenge that system and that logic. If we don't do that, then we can have all the good lawyers in the world. We're just going to be fighting a defensive battle for the rest of our lives and for the rest of eternity. So, so on the ground, what abolitionist politics looks like the most is systemic challenge. Right? A politics that is willing to engage in the urgency of survival and reform, but which is absolutely unwilling to stop there. 
which insists on saying this is not a reformist, this is not a problem that can be solved with reform. Reform ultimately is only going to perpetuate it. What we need to do is, is, is attack the fundamental institutional logic of what it is we are in. Uh, and that can happen in so many different kinds of ways. I think we need to be more creative in how we do it. I went to New Orleans and there were all these people working around prison abolition. And um, they had this, they had this broad view of what could happen instead of incarcerating people, chaining people, putting them in cages. And it was holistic. It was a good for the community and it was good for the person and it would just make a better world. And I, w I didn't know people were there doing that. No people thought like that, and it broadened my view of what could happen um, um, instead of incarceration, and it got me to thinking more broadly about um, uh, alternatives to prison, you know, prison abolition, uh, um, and it made me feel really good to be there. And uh, we met at an anti-prison organizing meeting and started talking. Uh, and I found out that she ran sober living homes for women who were coming home from prison. Uh, Melissa Birch came in and began, asked me could she come and do a workshop. And I said yes. And um, we began, she uh, actually designed it and uh, began to bring in information to the women. Same information that I had got, same information that allowed me to heal a little deeper both my pain and my shame of incarceration. Susan told me, you know, very early in our relationship that becoming politically conscious and understanding, you know, the larger set of conditions that had led to her own uh, addiction and imprisonment was really transformative for her in her own recovery and just becoming a new person after her release from incarceration began a partnership which later became the LEAD project, which stands for Leadership, Education, Action, and Dialogue. And so the project just started, you know, as a very grassroots effort uh, where myself and other members of Critical Resistance went to a new way of life uh, to one of the houses there for women and did workshops on different aspects of the prison industrial complex a couple of times a month. The purpose of the LEAD project is to create an environment and platform to give the uh, residents of a new way of life information uh, about incarceration, uh, uh, about, the, about the increase in the rates of incarceration, to give them the history of incarceration, information about alternatives to incarceration. Not only information about it, but it allows them to create their own vision and view of what could happen instead of incarceration. It also gives them um, uh, an understanding of the economics of incarceration. After women have participated, they go out with more of an awareness of what is going on and, and how systems are not functioning right. Um, they are able to advocate on behalf of themselves and their, their community. Um, they don't take it personal and take it in that they're not worthy. They understand that this person is not doing their job or this system is broken, and, and it allows them to be able to um, stand in the face of, of, um, of, of difficulties instead of being a victim of the, of the system once again. So the LEAD project grew to encompass three key components, the bi-monthly workshops, a political library at one of the houses of A New Way of Life, and an internship program uh, through which we started inviting a couple of women from A New Way of Life to do media projects that would explore these issues in further depth. A New Way of Life, um, contrast to prison or jail, um, just in a way that's it's way more productive, it's, it's the complete opposite. Um, a New Way of Life as a reentry project is great. But a new way of life as a, a preventative measure or as an alternative to prison would really be ideal. 
in contrast, jail <laughs> completely robs you of that ideal. You, it, you're, you're made to think that that's not only not possible, but that it shouldn't be that way. My name is Patricia, and um, we're going to walk over here to my apartment. I live in, right here in this apartment building <clears throat> that we're coming up to. Before I got to this apartment, um, I was living in a facility called A New Way of Life, and, and I, uh, I got there by means of uh, jail, and uh, I ended up staying there for about two years, and uh, the facility was real good to me. Um, they encouraged me to go to school, they encouraged me to do a lot of stuff. And it was through them that I got involved in the All of Us or None and the uh, LEAD uh, project workshops and my internship with them. But they helped me, you know, they helped me get my Section 8, my housing that I'm living in right now with my boys. Um, through a new way of life and through my Section 8, I was able to regain custody of my kids. Uh, Sue Burton had asked me to open up a sober living for her in Compton. Um, and I said, sure, why not? You know, that was awesome that she even thought that I had uh, those abilities. You know, she said, you know, Patricia, there's a lot about you that has been buried, that I see your potential, that you just don't even have a chance. You you've given, haven't given yourself a chance to, to have any of it grow. And, uh, you know, she makes me cry a lot, Sue does, you know, because there's, there's just little things, you know, Sue being with her background too, you know, and just the whole facility with everybody's background, it's kind of like a family thing. I'm grateful to Susan Burton because of her um, understanding of alternatives to the prison industrial complex. Her vision as being an alternative. So being part of that movement is, is powerful to me. There was another conference uh, in Oakland, in the San Francisco Bay Area, called a CR10, 10th Anniversary Conference. And what was so remarkable about that conference was that as I looked around, most of the participants were too young to have been at the first conference. Uh, so it was really very exciting to see uh, you know, young people uh, um, taking, taking these ideas and developing them in so many directions. Um, I went to the Critical Resistance Summit uh, Conference in Oakland just this past year, and I was so amazed. Was, there were so many people, and to see that, that so many other people have the same views as I do, was was strong to me. I say to myself, going to the convention and you know seeing all those movies that I saw about prison and about uh, abolishment. I say to myself, you know, there is a way. There is a way to live without prison. We can, as as a as a whole, you know, implement concepts to make that happen. I believe that there should be more. Um, you know, services that, uh, inter, uh, what's that called, intervention, you know, prior to, to actual damage, you know, when you see something starting, you know, um, facilities, more facilities for, for, chil for, for teenagers, you know, for, for mothers and children, you know, for single fathers and their children, you know. The prison industrial complex is so, um, it's everywhere. And so it's so hard to see that there can be anything to change it. So you need organizations like Critical Resistance and the conference to remind us on a daily basis because it's so easy to slip back into the comfortable, you know, idea that nothing can be done. So I think if you ask yourself the question, what can I do, there's not much you can do other than call the police or do nothing. But if you ask yourself the question, what can we do, there tends to be a lot of ideas that develop. For instance, like one group is sister to sister and they started kind of a sisters liberated ground where they use kind of street theater to teach people how they could um, intervene if they saw harassment or violence. And they actually did a, a video project where they videotaped the police who were the primary perpetrators of violence. So that goes to show again how um, the prisons are related to gender violence. When we did the exercise of, um, of a world without prisons mm -hmm. and I got the opportunity to actually build the neighborhood that I envisioned as a neighborhood where I wanted to live. 
you know, it brought the concept home and real alive for me that if we had those um, basic needs, the institutions within our community, there would be no huge police force literally hunting us down, and especially hunting young folks in our community, you know, hunting them down and incarcerating them. And we'd have universities, you know, we'd have co-ops, we'd have parks, um, we'd have arts. We have a lot of different things, you know, that, a lot of things that we need and don't have today. Mm -hmm. Our project was to imagine a community without sort of what we thought security would look like without police and prisons. So it's just trying to think about what security means apart from just aggressive aggression and heavy policing it's, and abandoning people and sending them to jail. Mm -hmm. To imagine a community that would be our ideal community. So to think about the communities that we live in now and to think about the things that we would change and what we would create if we could create our own ideal place to live and work and love and what what that would look like and what that would include. That's huge. Yep. Animals. Animals. Oh. Oh. The animals just kind of run free. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Like, what does that look like? What would it look like? I don't, we don't like that in our community. They go in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> the garden. By doing this work around prison issues, we would be compelled to come up with um, new ideas of how to address um, uh, violence, intimate violence, uh, violence, you know, against children. Uh, I can say now that I am totally convinced that this uh, broken prison system, which has to be broken, it's a system that cannot be fixed, is in large part responsible for the pandemic of uh, child abuse, child sexual abuse in this country. Because we, when we assume that a person who has committed such a horrible act against a child only needs to be thrown away into a prison. That means we abdicate our responsibility of thinking about what has produced this individual who has committed uh, this horrendous act. If we think about that, usually we discover that this person was at one time in his or her life a victim of child abuse, um, him or herself. If we simply assume that using the prison system to deal with it is going to be the solution, we're actually perpetrating the problem. And we're allowing that generational dynamic to continue over and over and over again. I think uh, politics of abolition is a positive uh, politics. It's a positive vision and not really a negative vision. I think when people hear prison abolition, they freak out and think you're saying, tear down all the walls tomorrow. And just like if you have a critique of the nation state, you think smash the state, whereas what I think it is, it's about crowding out these things with positive alternatives. So for instance, back to the anti-violence movement, I don't think the question we're saying, asking is, should a, somebody call the police if they're under attack? Because I think they got to do what they got to do. The question is, why do they have no other options but to call the police? So I think our goal is to proliferate these alternatives until eventually they squeeze out the prison industrial complex and squeeze out the state. So abolition, abolition, abolition. Um, abolition uh, proposes that we all think about and act on our thinking about the fact that the liberation movements of the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries have not been completed. The grand liberation movements of modernity have never been accomplished. We've done pieces here and pieces there, but we're still fighting for large-scale freedom. Freedom from racism, freedom from sexism, freedom from heteronormativity, and freedom from capitalism, and for the need to imagine that my game must be your loss. So abolition is a way 
for me to think about all of the freedom struggles that people have been uh, in, engaged in all over the world around so many different issues and pulling those, the threads of those struggles all together in a moment where we can see, we can really see and feel how prison is a central piece of the puzzle of how it is we all get free, right? So prison abolition is not, in my view, simply a, a kind of a silly notion of, oh, well, we just like the, uh, unlock all the prisons, tell everybody, oops, we didn't mean it, sorry, see you later, and then get on with our lives unchanged in all other respects. That's crazy. It's crazy. What's not crazy, however, um, but which uh, is called crazy by some, is the idea that we stop and think how it is there are two and a half million people in prison in the United States. That the United States has fully one quarter of all the prisoners on the planet locked up here in cages in the United States, and say, well, what makes the United States different in its broad-based use of prisons, and how does that connect to all of the other unfinished liberation movements that I just kind of listed briefly? Um, liberation from what? Liberation from uh, homelessness. Liberation to be educated. Liberation to be in one's body as one wishes to be in one's body, including changing, if that's what one wants to do. All of these uh, aspects of life that over time have been uh, marginalized and criminalized uh, come back to the center when we think really hard about prison. Angela Davis has written a book called Abolition Democracy, and I think in her book she lays out some of the, the, the larger and forward-looking political principles of, of what it is I'm trying to describe. But on the ground, for me, what abolition looks like is the kind of radical dependency that I described when I talked about how uh, communities that have lots of people sent to prison are more disorderly and desperate than communities that are otherwise the same, uh, that don't have lots of people sent to prison. The answer, what do we have instead of prisons, you know, people often want a very simple answer. Well, instead of prisons, we have a new way of life. And that's part of the answer, definitely, but really, uh, you know, envisioning a world without prisons to me means envisioning a whole different world. So we would have to start with a society that actually had meeting people's basic needs as its first priority rather than profits and a, you know the greed driven system that we have. And so you know people having access to food, clothing, shelter, quality education, living wage jobs, adequate housing, um, if we were to actually provide for those things as a society, uh, most of what is called crime would disappear. If we're going to uh, address kind of community-based responses to violence that we can't presume that communities are not sexist, homophobic, or otherwise problematic, or that we even have an intact community to begin with. So the point of having the critical resistance and inside do a statement together was to try to call for a different approach that proactively centers gender violence when we look at alternatives to the prison industrial complex, but also centers the need for a political organizing approach that is around building communities that will hold people accountable. But um, what I found was that in many other countries, there's just no illusion the state's going to do anything for you. There's often more creative ideas about what to do because the state just is clearly not going to do anything. So for instance, uh, one example was when we talked to the landless movement in Brazil. Um, this is a movement where landless people you take over land that's not being used and they stay there until um, they get the rights to stay on that land recognized. But w during this process, um, they can't um, call on the police because the police are trying to kick them out of the, this land. So they develop an alternative governance system. So all sectors of society are governed by one man and one woman. woman and then all these uh, leadership positions are rotating so nobody has all the power. And then the people in charge of enforcing security are women who use machetes to enforce security. And so if there's a, a dispute, like kind of a bell rings and everybody goes to that place, so there's also no isolation. Like everything has to be dealt with in a very transparent way. So you kind of have less hierarchy so that that breeds kind of a power, abuse of power. You have more transparency so there's less isolation. 
and then you have women in these powerful roles that makes people rethink the way they think of women. Anyway, they said that there's no magic cure, but the longer these occupations happen, the less abuse there is. So I think this is informative for us because we're all structured to interact after the violence has happened, but they're creating societies where violence stops happening in the first place. I don't think ever, in, even in the perfect society, we would never be completely free from violence or harm or you know, people hurting one another sometimes. And so what would we do instead of that? We would need to build another system of community accountability where people could be held accountable for their actions, but within a much broader context. So, you know, if I hurt someone in my community, we look at how we can hold me accountable for that and how I can, you know, make that up to that person. But we also look at what are the circumstances in my life that led me to act in that way? And is there some way that I need healing or something that's not whole in my life? So really looking at a system that not only punishes individuals, but rather holds whole communities accountable for behavior and tries to actually get at the root of the problems. The main thing that doesn't work about the prison industrial complex is that it doesn't actually ever ask, you know, why did this act of violence happen? Or why did this person steal this thing? It never gets at the actual roots of the problem. So I think abolition envisions just a very different system where instead of just punishing acts, we would actually try to solve underlying problems that lead to harm. A new way of life is part of an abolitionist vision, part of what we envision in terms of, you know, what would we do without prisons. It's a safe place where women heal, recover, examine what happened in their lives, and try to move forward. And that it is the kind of community-based institution that is part of, a key part of an abolitionist vision. So the partnership, you know, a partnership between critical resistance and a new way of life is critical, I think, to building this vision of abolition. Now I think we can say that there's not only a critical resistance organization, and that organization is very important. It's headquartered in Oakland. There are chapters uh, all over the country, strong chapters in New York, a very strong chapter in New Orleans and in other places. But there's also a broader movement. Uh, many people now are aware of this thing we call prison industrial complex. And also, the, and this was the hallmark of the most recent conference, uh, um, the, the, the notion of prison abolition uh, doesn't seem so way out and crazy any longer. People are very seriously considering a prison abolition. I'm here because I don't know how to live, and somebody made a call. I didn't know they were going to call Susan, mm -hmm. but they called, and thank God. You know, so I'm grateful for it, too. You know, and I, and I don't say thank you because it, 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 it's not, I can't say thank you. Mm -hmm. I can just show you in my behavior and show you that, when, like she said, when it's time for me to go. And one day maybe I can uh, be running a house or doing something if I give myself open mind and just be still. Just be still long enough to do something in my life. So if they had more programs like this or more people in the world like Ms. Burton, maybe there would be some help in the people that really wanted it. Because see, I didn't know I wanted it until I, until I walked through the door. I hope that being here in a new way of life, that people are able to reconnect with themselves, with their true selves, their sense of self, the, um, the ownership of who they are and not what they have to become because of the environment being so uh, injurious. This is the first home that I opened up for women coming home from prisons in 1998. It was my home, uh, it had three bedrooms, and I just went for it. I wanted to make a difference you know, in my community, in the lives of women who so desperately needed a chance. So this is where the women and their children live. And when we first opened up, this was my whole little space that I lived in and worked in. I had a day bed and uh, a computer and a file cabinet in there. And uh, 
this is one of the bedrooms. It's a good space. The kids, kids room. Yes, the kids room. These are just some of the kids who belong to the women. And I just want to say it's not Betty Ford, but it's home and a place where people can heal, uh, reunite with their children, start family, find their place in the community, and go on to live a, uh, a constructive and productive life and hopefully become an advocate and a voice for prison abolition.